Good evening, my name's Amy McDonald. I run this joint. How many of you, this is your first time here tonight? Oh, so a lot of you have been here, great. How many have come to our Curated Cuisine series before? Great, thank you. It's one of our most popular monthly series. This is our last one for the year, 2023, but we'll be starting up again in January. We've already booked January, February, almost March and April, so keep an eye out for that announcement. Uh, we're so excited to have Clancy Miller with us tonight to talk about her new book, For the Culture, Phenomenal Black Women and Femmes in Food. The book is a treasure trove of profiles of women you've never heard of, heard of and you should know, interviews with pioneering black cooks and farmers and mixologists, and lots and lots and lots of recipes. The book began as a magazine she founded by the same name, For the Culture, Clancy herself is a trained cook and food writer who has written for all the major rags. New York Times Magazine, Washington Post, Food and Wine, The Cut, Bon Appetit, Vogue. Joining her midway through the program are two women she profiles in the book, L. Simone Scott, a trained chef, food stylist, and the first African-American host to appear on the PBS show American Test Kitchen, and Kaisha Davenport, acclaimed bartender at Comfort Kitchen. I think we have a lot of Comfort Kitchen folks here tonight. <laughs> have to go if you haven't been. Community activist and the first black woman to receive Boston's Restaurant of the Year Award and a James Beard nomination. Moderating tonight's discussion is Tamika Francis, one of our favorite curated cuisine moderators, who is passionate about cooking, farming, and storytelling. Her company, Food and Fo Folklore, pays homage to global food traditions. Please welcome Clancy and Tamika. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Boston. Good. To, hey, Nicole. Sorry. Good to see you all. Welcome to Boston. Thank you. Great. Thank you for New Yorker. Well, thank you all for coming out. This is awesome. I've been having a great day in Boston. Good. So, good. Um, this is the cherry on top. Well, we're ecstatic to have you. And as usual, I have two jobs, to speak slowly and to welcome to Boston and then to hear your story and especially about this amazing, amazing book. Um, let's start by learning about you by asking the question, what does home taste like for you? What's Clancy's home story, food story? Um, you know, it's very funny. My very first babysitter in the whole wide world, Liz Van Cleef, is in the front row. One of my, <gasps> my actual oldest friend, like dear, she is family um, because she has known me since before I was born. Wow. Um, literally saw me in my mama's belly. So um, she sent me a message today talking about memories of us sitting at my little red plastic table in New Haven, Connecticut, and eating bowls of goldfish, and also Milano cookies, yeah, and also fish sticks. I don't have a clear memory of the fish sticks, okay. but that's all to say that some of my food memories start at that little round red plastic table. Um, Mississippi mud pie was my very first. What's that? Tell um, me. It's kind of like. I think of it, so like imagine an Oreo cookie crust in kind okay. of like a, a chocolate cream pie situation. Okay. That's how I would describe it. Situation. Yes. Pace for chef. <laughs> and, is a pace for chef. Yeah. Situation. <laughs> that was my first favorite dessert. We used okay. to go to the chart house in New Haven and I would always order that in, on every subsequent menu. I've always been concerned with dessert first. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of like, home is sweet, home is dessert, home is, um, yeah, those are, but those are my formative memories, yeah. or some of them. Yeah, thanks yeah. for sharing. So home was physically 
New Haven, Connecticut, but also taste sweet. Yeah. Born in New Haven. We left when I was four, moved to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Um, So I've got Southern roots on my mom's side of the family is uh, from Virginia. My dad's side is from Georgia. Then at 12, we moved to Philadelphia. And um, I still consider Philadelphia one of my homes. My dad is still there. My mom recently passed. And I've been living in New York on and off since my teen years. I went to Columbia, went back to Philadelphia, um, and I live there now. Great. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. So this phenomenal, extraordinary publication just came out and um, we'll have copies in the lobby. So tell us about the why behind this. What was the catalyst? What was the story? What was the why that got you here? So uh, there are a few why or a few answers to that. But one is that when I was first uh, interested in food, I, and I think I got really interested. I grew up in a house eating well. My mom is a great cook. My dad's a good cook. We always went to restaurants. So that interest was always kind of there. But in college, I had my first food job. It was my work study job. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was working at a cafeteria in charge of the stir fry station. And, um, it only lasted for one semester, but I was like, I kind of like this. And then by the time I graduated from school, I kind of felt like food was something I wanted to explore, yeah. but I didn't, I didn't have that many people in mind who were role models. I knew of Julia Child. I knew of B. Smith mm-hmm. because when I graduated, we celebrated at her restaurant, B. Smith's. Yeah. Um, and I, but I didn't know of the legacy that black people in general have in hospitality and specifically black women and femmes. So I, I truly did write this book for my 21 year old self who would have benefited from knowing that there are numerous role models, um, who are black women in food and that this is a legacy that we carry and that black women are culture makers in many, many, many fields, but also in food. In food, yeah. So I wanted to create a resource that could be for people who are into food, people who are contemplating careers in food. That's how it came to be. That's the why. And you started with a magazine initially, and then you parlayed into um, a book of 66 or so folks. Um, what was the transition from the magazine initially, the concept, into a publication? So the idea of the magazine was kind of similar to the book, but what I was going for with For the Culture, a magazine celebrating black women and femmes and food and wine, long title, was um, I wanted to center storytelling from a black woman's perspective. So black women writers, photographers, illustrators, and black women as the subjects, the people written about um, and telling stories. And so that's how the magazine started. What would it look like to look at food through a black woman's gaze? And then George Floyd was murdered. And the publisher for my first book, Cooking Solo, reached out to me and asked if I would be interested in doing another book with them. And they had an idea. I wasn't particularly interested in the idea that they presented. And um, I said, listen, I'm working on this magazine and here's what it's about. And I'd like to do a book in exactly the same vein, but here's how I would tweak it for a book form. I would have interviews, recipes, and personal essays on culinary matriarchs who are no longer here. So that's how the, the pivot right, happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're taking audience questions on slido.com and we enter cuisine and we can take your questions here. We have our first question from the audience. How did your magazine prepare you for writing this book? Um, that's a great question. I think, well, I already had the concept down, so that was helpful. And then I, like, there were people who I knew I wanted to work with and or interview for this book. So Kelly Marshall shot the cover of the magazine. 
Uh, it's the cover of Dr. Jessica B. Harris. Fairy godmother. Yes, who's a genius and an icon. She's also the author of many books. One that is in the spotlight these days is High on the Hog. It's a Netflix series now. Um, but in any case, Kelly Marshall, a genius photographer, shot um, Dr. J. And so I knew I wanted Kelly involved in this. And then some of the people in the first issue, I also wanted to reach out to interview. Great. So speaking of Dr. J, um, you start this book with paying homage to, or I like to say four mothers, right, or ancestors. Um, you mentioned Julia Childs earlier, who co-founded the BU Culinary Program here, but there are others, right, women in food. You mentioned um, sorry, B. Smith. You mentioned others. Like, who else is in the book as four mothers, as ancestors, sure. as those who came before us? Okay, so um, Edna Lewis. Yeah. Leah Chase, Lena Richard, B. Smith, and Verda Mae Smart Grovesner uh, are the people who I chose to focus on as culinary matriarchs who are no longer here. Um, I knew I wanted to honor them, and they're no longer living, so I felt like I wanted to write essays on them. Yeah, Thank you. And so this book currently have 66 or so. It's not 100, it's not 75, it's 66. Not it's, quite a rounded random. number. Yeah. Um, how did you go about the selection process? Not all the folks here are chefs. They're all in the food space in some way. And 21-year-old Clancy is looking for someone in the food sector. How did you find these people and why? So I was going for vastness. I wanted to show the vast options available uh, in terms of paths in the hospitality field. So I didn't want to just focus on chefs because when I was 21, I thought you were a chef, a baker, a restaurant owner uh -huh. that I didn't really see other areas, yeah. you know? So of course I wanted to in include chefs and bakers and restaurant owners, right. but I also wanted to include sommeliers and tea sommeliers and pop-up chefs and food writers and producers of food documentaries, such mm -hmm. as the producers of High on the Hog. Right. Um, I wanted to include people who have television shows, people who are television personalities, um, people of different ages. I wanted it to be multi-generational. So the youngest person in the book, Rahana um, Bissaret Martinez is 18, I think. Wow. I don't know the age of the oldest person in the book, but yeah. it's it's multi-generational. Multi yeah, correct. And I wanted it to be reflective of the diaspora. So yeah. there are people from the continent of Africa, throughout the Caribbean, throughout the U.S., people based in Europe. Mm -hmm. There, it's a really good mix of people. Great. What surprised you in the research? How did you arrive at these folks? What were, what did come up for you in the research? Um, I think Lena Richard, who whose name actually might be pronounced Lena Richard. She uh, was born in New Orleans. She is a precursor to Julia Child's culinary legacy in terms of she had a TV show more than a decade before um, Julia Child. And she had a TV show in the South, in New Orleans, in the Jim Crow South. She had a restaurant. She had cook, she wrote a cookbook. She had a culinary school. I learned about her very recently. And there was a great article that came out in USA Today a few years ago on her. And I was fascinated learning her story because other people specifically of the culinary matriarchs I had read about more. Right. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Lena Richard, it was just like, holy smoke, this woman was doing Existed. everything. Yeah. She had a line of food. She had like a frozen food line. Like packaged uh, foods. Packaged foods, gumbo, like everything you think of when you think of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. All of this <laughs> way back when in the right. 50s in New Orleans. And she was doing it all. So she's entrepreneurial. Yeah. I was deeply fascinated by her story. What would you tell your 21 year old self? Like prior to the work you've done, how you arrive at where you are, what would you tell your 21 year old self? It depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> on the most I'm ideal. Like, go to medical school. Um, <laughs> other times. On the most ideal, optimistic, <laughs> sunny sky day. Um, be patient. Yeah. Be patient. 
Um, listen to people's stories. Go. I mean, I, I kind of tell her to do what I ended up doing, (laughs) but, but I would say be patient and, um, don't expect to see the dots connected as you go forward Mm because that doesn't always happen. Got you. Well, thanks for sharing that. It sounds like your path was not quite linear. And speaking of non-linear path, we're going to um, invite two of our friends Yay. who are also profiled in this book, L. Simone Scott and Kaisha Davenport, to join us Yay. and to hear their stories. Hurrah. Welcome, Al. Hey, Kai. Long time to see <laughs> so um, we're going to pick up from, again, we're taking questions on slido.com, hashtag cuisine, and we'd love to hear your questions being integrated in the conversation. So Clancy and I were talking just now about, well, you were here, you heard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the nonlinear path, and I was reading your profile, Elle, I'll start with you. Um, say who you are, what you do, but also, if I read correctly, you were a social worker at one point, and now you're in the food space. So speaking of nonlinear path. Yeah, there's nothing linear about my path, <laughs> past or present. Um, I am currently a food stylist and TV talent, now cookbook author at America's Test Kitchen. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and... Yeah, I started off as a social worker. I think, I, I, I mean, I obviously always had a love for food, you know. Um, I grew up in a family of good cooks. My running joke is that um, I'm not the best cook in my family. I'm just the only one who does it professionally. Mm. Right, it's a lot of really great cooks in my family. But I enjoyed more than just the food part, but the things that came along with preparing meals, like the, you know, the conversations that happen between family members, the opportunities to bond, um, the opportunity to just be, you know, because in the in the black family household, children in adult conversations is non-existent, <laughs> right? So if you wanted to know what was going on, you had to be present and quiet. So I would just pick a task, which could be picking collard greens, um, you know, baking cornbread for the stuffing, right? I would take my responsibility as an opportunity to be in the know <laughs> of what was going on in the family c- circle, you know? So um, so I've always been a bit of a cook and a social worker, like, my whole life. I always wanted to know how to solve the problems, right. you know, and food just was kind of part of that. So, you know, um, at some point, during one of these many recessions we have, I... Um, had an opportunity forced to (laughs) explore a new career. And I was like, well, if I'm going to have to do something for the next 20 plus years, it has to be something I really love. And I opted to go into culinary. I was already kind of moonlighting, you know, hostessing at restaurants. I was already in that world. My first job was a server at a restaurant. I don't know if anyone's from the Midwest familiar with Olga's Kitchen. But that was like my first server job. So I've been in food as long as I've been working. And it is just a space where I felt comfortable and at home. I loved it because it accepted every walk of life into it, you know. So that's how I came into, you know, food professionally. Kind of forced but willing. (laughs) Yeah. So I want to kind of go in on, it says here, founder of She Chef, which I know has since kind of sunset. But I found you through She Chef. Can you say what that was and why in a similar um, vein of mentorship and also like showing this work, what that was. Sure. Um, I mean, she chef was was born out of what I felt was a necessity of rep- representation mm-hmm. in the in the industry. I was working in New York City where I've been living for some time, and while I was in culinary school, there were plenty of black, brown, and other people there. But when I got into the workforce, I did not see that represented, and I was very curious. The social worker and me was very curious as to why. Or, you know, why not? And um, I figured, how about, this is, I'm going to date myself, but do you all remember meetup.com? Yeah. It's still. Okay. It's like six. Is it still existing? Yeah. Okay. Well, it, if you said MySpace, though. <laughs> that too, that too. Um, I decided to do a little meetup group of other women in food, you know, like if you need support, you know. 
Um, because after doing some research with the career services person at my school, we found that a lot of people, a lot, especially women, were leaving the field because of the non-traditional work hours. It's very difficult to get childcare um, and things of the sort. You know, depending on your culture and family structure, you know, it, it, perhaps you were responsible for the family for the most part and had to take a job that paid more or something along those lines. So the reasons people were leaving... I wanted to be a support to them so they would not have to exit the industry that they love. So that's how She Chef was born. And it has taken much shape and size over the years. I mean, currently we're on a little hiatus so that I could be a cookbook author a little bit, you know, but and it will it will resurface in another way, you know, to support um, black women and femmes and food, you know, and, um, you know, this book is a carryover for me. So when I was asked to be involved in this book, it was automatic yes, yep. right? Because it it was, it was carried over into the mission that I've believed in from the very beginning. Great, thank you. Yeah. And public thanks to you. I found She Chef while in culinary school and I was like, oh my God, somewhere to belong to. So and thank here you we for are. Work. Here we are. Hello. Kai. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. So um, amazing interview as usual. I. I pulled out here, bartending school at 18. So you're in the hospitality field in the drink sector. Yes. Um, tell me the story of bartending at 18 and what you're building with Bar Noir and otherwise. Um, so I tried to go to college. That didn't work. I'm, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. And my mom's thing was always, you graduate high school, you get a job. Like, mm -hmm. and, and get it done. Mm -hmm. And so... I would have been, I guess, the second person in my family to go to college, and that didn't work out the way I expected it to. And I was at home, and I was on Craigslist, and Craigslist said, you can make a lot of money. Click here. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so I was like, OK, you know, I wanted to prove myself in some way. And so it turned out to be bartending school. And I, you know, I had no concept of bartending or cocktails, obviously, because I wasn't old enough to drink, but I know that my aunt loved some E&J, and my grandma loved her Bacardi, and her friend loved Tangeray, so I had an idea. Um, so I asked my mom, I was like, I know I have disappointed you, but can I have $600? <laughs> and I was shocked she gave it to me. I still, to this day, I look at her like, you really did that? Okay. <laughs> So um, I went to bartending school. I went to this hole in the wall in New York City. And I learned so much, actually. Bartending school is hit or miss, I would say. But this one was really comprehensive. And uh, we had lots of drills. And we learned a variety of drinks. And um, I mean, I was always within some sort of community space. And so I also had this other skill in my back pocket. And um, I got a job at the Barclays Center when I was, I think, 20, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I became a shop steward, which is like an on-the-job lawyer for uh, a unionized uh, workplace. And so I did a lot of organizing while bartending, um, organizing our first contract. And I mean, we're talking about like hundreds of workers, um, specifically black and brown workers. I feel like I did less bartending there and more organizing. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to that. Yes, you have to. But um, I, in, in kind of thinking about a linear path, it has stayed fairly linear for me, even though every year I was like, I'm doing it wrong and I need to start over. But um, staying within the community space and using cocktails and mixology to um, continue to organize within those spaces. Yeah, great. And you'll be doing a demo for us later on. And I fail to introduce you properly because I know you. Where are you now? <laughs> what do you work on? Um, well, my name is Kaisha, and I am the beverage director at Comfort Kitchen. Um, I, like I said, I'm born and raised in New York. I'm pushing eight years in Boston. It's crazy. But I've worked in um, uh, labor and org organizing here. I've worked at several different bars and restaurants in Boston. I briefly owned a small restaurant in Somerville, which got me very prized, I swear. I still think about it. I'm like, why, why me? Why did this happen to like win a, a, a Restaurant of the Year Award as a black woman in, in greater Boston? And um, it's not. No, it's not awesome, because this is 2019. Uh, I mean, in, the, in this vein of uh, phenomenal black women and femmes in food, yep. why, why did it take 2019 to 
find somebody, anybody, you know. I don't think of myself as like super special in that vein, but anyone of all the great um, black women who are creating food and food spaces in Boston, why did it take so long? So it's, it's, it's right. bittersweet. It is, it is. It's and cute, we have though. a question that actually follows up nicely to that um, from the audience. Do you think female cooks, I'm gonna put cooks slash chefs slash food people, um, have contributed more than male chefs to the culinary history? From the audience. <laughs> yeah, from absolutely. the audience. Well, yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk more. I mean, we know that in the restaurants, we know in the food space, um, we are matriarchs, right? So in the home space, very often, not always, um, women and femme are the ones making food and passing on traditions, right? But it doesn't translate to the restaurant industry where primary white male chefs are owners and the chefs. So can we speak to that dichotomy of where the, where the history comes from, the tradition comes from, and then what happens in the restaurant industry? Things just got yeah, serious. I, you know, <laughs> um, I mean, we know you're absolutely right. You know that the the history is definitely the matriarch making food. Um, most chefs will tell you they learn from their grandmother, their nona. All the men, they'll tell you that. They will admittedly tell you that. But what happens in terms of ownership and leadership that falls under that falls under more of a political uh, umbrella, right? We're mm -hmm. talking about patriarchy we're talking about capitalism right mm -hmm. like that that's kind of how that happens you know and i mean that's really the cut and dry you know explanation like if it were left up to the people who are actually doing the teaching in the kitchen those would be the people who would be owning the restaurants but right. we already know the disparity between men and women who are able to get capital right. to open businesses in mm -hmm. any city across the united states it's, it's, I think it's like something like a 65 to 70% gap, you know, it's in, in, I mean, that's just what it is. We're talking about, we're, we're talking about politics versus reality. Right. You right, know, right. and that's always the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Clients, I'm going to pull you in here from your research and from this book. There are folks in here who are restaurant owners, hoteliers, and there are folks who are primarily entrepreneurs doing independent work. What did you uncover in terms of how folks are finding their way in the industry without capital, without recognition? I think there's a lot of improvisation involved. Mm -hmm. I, there are a lot of pop-up chefs yep. in the book, which I think is a really innovative and great way to share your food and your perspective without having to rely on the capital necessary to mm -hmm. open a brick and mortar restaurant. Yeah. Um, so I think that is one way. And I think, frankly, that's a part of our history in terms of f making a way, you know? Um, and I think there are numerous people in the book who do that in different ways. Yeah. We also have quite a bit of folks who are in the wine space, the drink space, the cocktail space, and then those who are just in food in general, in terms of like just teaching, talking, otherwise, can you speak to the other ways in which folks can be a part of the food industry by not just being in restaurants or in the, um, as chefs? Um, well, I think you mean in terms of jobs or in terms of like- Jobs, career paths, um, just participating in general. I think, well, there, one of the reasons why I wrote the book is because it's like, look at all these people doing all these different things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I should also note more than a few people wear different hats, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of having a full time job here, but also doing X, Y or Z. So yeah, there's I know. the <laughs> me too. Um, there's the freelance side of it, the idea that you you can dip your toes in, in different ways. Like there's a uh, Janine Copeland in the book. She does wine pop-ups, like educational moments in wine bars, introducing people to different wines. And so in that case, and there's also, um, Marianne Lou Martin, who started out as a lawyer in France and became an hotelier in Morocco. Right. And, she started out just basically helping her parents purchase a property in Morocco, mm -hmm. but then dove in in terms of her interest in being there and acquiring a property and creating a hotel. But one of the pieces of advice she gives in the book is develop a community of people 
find develop a community. Yeah. And then as soon as you develop a community, it can be on Instagram, it can be in real life. Then you have some, you have a platform or you have a group of people to share something with. It could be a wine education night. It could be a pop-up. It mm -hmm. could be whatever it is that is your thing. Find some like minds. Find some people who are interested in it so that you can share it together. So that's what some people in the book are doing. Yeah. And I think it's good. Yeah. And without permission, love or community, El Kai here from Boston are in the audience right now. So we thank you all who have been supporting our pop-ups or events and everything that we do. So we see you. We appreciate you all. Yay. Thank you. So we have, um, here's a question from the audience. What was the most challenging aspect of curating the book? Uh, what didn't make it? What qualified? What qualities were cut? Um, or made the cut, rather. The most challenging was knowing that I wasn't going to include as many people as I could have. So everybody in the book is somebody I admire who I've mm -hmm. been like following <laughs> or stalking um, <laughs> <laughs> online or reading about in magazines, newspapers. And I can you I didn't fully answer the initial question you had about how I curated the book. Yeah. There was another publisher interested in this book project and they wanted me to interview a hundred people. And I thought, absolutely not, because mm. I knew I would be the one <laughs> doing the interview. doing the work mm -hmm. in it in under a year or in a year. And I just thought, a hundred, that's too much. Okay. That I can't do that. I mean, I I didn't want to do a hundred people. Mm -hmm. But I was like, 60 something sounds robust. So, <laughs> so it came down to people who said yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying yes. Um, so people who said yes, that made it easy. The hard part also was, I thought every single interview was great. Mm -hmm. And, but there are only certain number of pages. Like when I, you sign the book contract, it's like, I don't know. 200 and something pages. The mechanics of it. Yeah. So in my perfect world, every interview would have been 20 pages. <laughs> right. Because some of the interviews were 20 minutes. Some of the interviews were an hour and a half. And so that was very hard, editing interviews and making, trying to pick out my favorite juicy parts because mm -hmm. there were a lot of juicy parts. Yeah. Um, as, an, uh, sorry, as a foreign-born person living here in the U.S., this question is more so from me. Um, what was the impetus or catalyst for going global, right? So you were an American-born person. Like, why do you think about going global versus just sticking to within that number of folks who were just here locally? Um, the story of black people because of chattel slavery and the transatlantic slave trade is that we are a diaspora. Right. That doesn't mean that every black person on the planet comes from an enslaved lineage, right. but... Mm -hmm. That is, I don't, like, I couldn't just focus on black women who are U.S. born without, I don't know, it just felt like it would be incomplete. Yeah. You know? And also, in terms of the people who make up cuisine and culture, I feel like it is global. You know what I mean? And even though I'm focusing on black women and femmes, we are we are part of a diaspora and we are global. So I, I didn't want to ignore that. Thank you for sharing that. And so the book has both interviews, inspiration and recipes. Kai, you had a mudslide, 90s mudslide. Can you say more about the inspiration behind that? Oh man, so this was during the <laughs> pandemic. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was invited to um, create a cocktail for a virtual movie night and the movie that was selected for me to do a cocktail for is a classic movie and it's right, but it had a really, a harsh undertone of um, homophobia and specifically, <clears throat> excuse me, um, being anti-trans women. And so I decided not to participate in the, the movie night, but knowing me, I was like, well, now I'm gonna do the most. And so I was <laughs> like, I will, Let's make a cocktail in honor of really incredible trans women who mm. deserve a space in, a, in a, an iconic movie like that. The movie was Boomerang. Let's just say that. Um, 
I was like, we're not doing that. Come on now. Um, so, so with uh, with love, uh, the mudslide from the '90s originally was called to Rita with love from the '90s. It was a cocktail created in honor of Rita Hester, who was um, an Austin-based black woman, a Sag Sag gang, phenomenal um, human being whose life was taken away far too soon. And because of her legacy, we now honor the Trans Day of Remembrance every year. And uh, the bar that she used to frequent, she ordered mudslides a lot. Uh, a lot of her friends said she really loved mudslides. So I don't particularly like mudslides. That's a lot of sugar. <laughs> but I wanted to create a cocktail that was um, what I imagined had uh, Rita been allowed to live her life and grow old with us, maybe a more updated version of a mudslide that was befitting of her beauty, her grace, her class, and her legacy. So. Mm. Yeah. She's that girl. I'm literally having chills because I heard her story on the radio this this morning. So oh, thank wow. you. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, yeah. L, special yeah. loaf. I'm not going to rap. Special girl, real good girl. <laughs> special <laughs> loaf Biggest is the name of your recipe. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Tell me the story behind <laughs> special loaf. Um, well, it's originally called special K loaf. Right. That's what that's the, the cereal. Special yes. Okay. Yes. So I grew up seven day Adventist okay. and um, a lot of us, you know, there's there's a temperance laws that that are followed and a lot. Of, and, you know, there's the way we eat. Right. Um, I, I don't practice that now in terms of temperance eating. But one of the things that I grew up on uh, was this special K loaf, which mm. um, was very popular you know, if we had dinner at the church, no meat. You could not have meat at the church. Very strict rules. And so the special K loaf was kind of like the thing amongst Seventh-day Adventist Christians, right? And so, like, it kind of was almost like a constant cook-off of who could make the best special K loaf. Like, whose loaf tasted less like vegetarian meat? <laughs> I don't know why we would be aiming for that when we're trying to be vegetarians, but... <laughs> Um, it was it was something I grew up having an appreciation for the ways in which um, the black church, specifically the Seventh Day Adventist black church, mm -hmm. uh, found ways to recreate the things that they grew up eating, maybe in the mm -hmm. rural South or mm -hmm. even in the North. My family's from the North; they're from Michigan, from Detroit. Um, you know how they would how they would tweak these recipes to make them so good, you know, and you'd be like, man, that was almost just like chicken. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they, it was such an art, you yeah, know, it yeah. it's, it's an art and you had to be a certain age to get it right. Like if you were under 30, you didn't know how to do it. And that's just the bottom line. Um, but I loved, I loved eating that way. Like I was practically vegetarian, like most of my high school years. That's what they, I went to seven day Adventist high school and that's how we ate. Um, so it was kind of like an homage to um, black vegetarianism, black veganism, mm -hmm. which is very seldom talked about, um, you know, to the the ways in which people of the diaspora can shape shift food. Um, so, you know, so that was that was just one. Of, it was also one of my very favorite particular recipes. Um, my grandmother didn't make it much. I I was to ask you, who's making this loaf? Well, it, all, the, all the mothers, okay. all yep. the grandmothers, yep. all the grandmothers <laughs> made it. Um, older mothers made it. People who had bigger families would make it, mm -hmm. right? Because it's a loaf, right? And it can feed a, a more people. Right, gotcha. Definitely the lunch lady at my high school was making it. <laughs> Again, the lunch lady, yes. right? the black family. Yes, yeah. yes. And it was. It just was a, a favorite. You, if you, you just either could make it or you couldn't. And and if you could, you were and it was a rite of passage. You yes, allow it to. Yes, it. I think yeah. I, I make a pretty good one. I haven't done it in a long since I retested for the book, but yeah. um, I love it. And it is made with special case cereal because they are based in Michigan. Mm. Kellogg is based in Michigan. For if you didn't that. know. Yeah. Tony the Tigers from Detroit. <laughs> I love it. I'm, I'm kidding. I don't know that for a fact, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the special K loaf is definitely very Midwest. You will hear a lot of it about about it in mid Midwest. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you. I feel like I have a Tony is <laughs> Tony's from Battle Creek, Michigan. Thanks, Steve. We got yes. confirmation. We got confirmation. <laughs> He's here. from Battle Creek. Yeah, close enough. 
this is a good conversation. I yeah. feel like I got a chance to know each of you through your work, through your um, inspiration. Again, this is an awesome. I spent most of the last week or so going through each of these interviews, Googling things on the side, like, who's this person? And again, I felt like this is also the book I wanted 10 or so years ago. So um, for folks who are in the food space or not, who are wanting to explore the careers, the path, and also the stories of um, folks in the food space, I feel like there are a hundred others you could have interviewed, but again... Thousands, thousands, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it feels like we're going to have a little bit of a cocktail situation we're going to have one we i'm so sorry y'all <laughs> sorry guys <laughs> there are rules Just against us serving you cocktails so um kai what do you have for us all right let's boogie so um one of my i would say my style of bartending i call diasporic mixology i like to use the flavors and ingredients to tell stories, often stories that are not told, um, and put them in a glass and serve them to you and share that story with you. Or if you want me or not want me. Right here. Here? Yeah. On the other side of you. OK. Yeah. So um, this cocktail is called The Silver Box. It is created in honor of um, a Boston-based black woman named Mildred Davenport. No relation, but maybe. She might have been my auntie. I didn't even know. Are you sure? I, I, we got to pull an African ancestry test. It's not called my name. It's not. So, you know, that would be kind of cool. It would be. Um, but she was, she was a pioneer. She was born in 1900. Uh, she was a, a dancer. And she had several dance schools in the South End. And one of them was originally at 522 Columbus. And it was called Silver Box Studios. Uh, Mildred uh, desegregated many popular dance stages in Boston in her time. She was, she served in the military. She was a professor at Tuskegee. She was everywhere. She served on the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination for 20 oh, wow. years. She was an organizer. She was a trailblazer. She deserves a martini. So Kai, she's your cousin. <laughs> she's Kai's cousin. Let's just agree she's Kai's cousin. She's my cousin. <laughs> Organizing, labor, get it, uh, cousin? You know. Okay. All right, so walk us through what you're making. Yes, so we're going to make a, a variation of a martini, uh, three-ingredient cocktail. This one is a little, uh, I would say, a little lighter, a little more floral, a little more aromatic and complex than your usual uh, heap of gin and uh, lots of olives, which Ellen and I agree, that's how we like a martini. Yeah, that's anyway. how I like it. <laughs> no shade. So uh, if you're I'm making... I'm going to pause you. Cause yes. Can you say what a martini is to begin with before sure. you kite it up? <laughs> Aside from the many stories about the origins of martinis, a martini is a gin-based cocktail. It's typically gin, vermouth, and you can add a twist of lemon, you can add olives. Uh, throughout the 70s and 80s, martinis became much sweeter, different, mm. uh, typically vodka-based, but um, a classic martini is a balance of gin and vermouth. So Heard. we've got some Bombay Sapphire, and I'm just going to pour two ounces of gin last two ounces yeah to the top i never knew what that measure was <laughs> <laughs> i'm not drinking at your house no i'm kidding i'm kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding. i can make food sometimes but i can never make a drink <laughs> and then i have a uh, saint germain it's an elderflower liqueur and i've been saying saint germain it's the it's the same girl look it's are we drinking it that's the question <laughs> So uh, I, I have a two and one ounce jigger, and so the other side of it is an ounce, but I'm going to pour three quarters of an ounce of St. Germain or St. Germain. I love, I mean, I feel like that's like a diasporic dialect thing. I'm going to anglicize so, all these words. Yes. It's like pecans and pecans. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but it's pecan. It is pecan. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Pecan? Oh, Lord, no, I hope not. I'm Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? This is um, Luxardo Bitter Bianco. It's an aromatic liqueur uh, flavored with wormwood, lots of different uh, herbs and botanicals and some spice. And uh, my girl, Tissili, is in the audience. This is our favorite. So, you know. TC, hey. Hey, Queen. So I'm just going to add a half ounce of that. How do you, how are you inspired to make these drinks? Like something comes to you in a dream, like how does it come up? Well, I knew, um, I was asked by Bacardi to create a cocktail for, I think this was Black History Fancy Month. Fancy pants. Um, <laughs> thank you. And so I was like, um, I want to tell uh, another story. I want to tell stories about um, women who I also didn't see growing up. I didn't know, uh, I mean, I was born in New York. There's a lot of diversity, obviously, but it was still really hard to find black women role models in food and beverage. 
And of course, when I came to Boston, I was like, oh goodness, we're just, we got our work cut out for us. <laughs> so um, this cocktail, I knew I wanted it to be graceful, okay. like Mildred was. I wanted it to be delicate, but still firm. I wanted it to speak to a wider audience in the way that she was able to do so. And everyone loves a martini. Well, not everyone, but this is the kind of martini that you could at least learn to love. And I, I wanted, I, the glass is probably the most important part because it's just really beautiful and, yeah. yes. and it's, it's, it's dreamy. And so I, I, I think I started from that space before I actually came uh, to a decision on the ingredients. Yeah. This is a wine glass. Yes. OK. <laughs> a martini glass. Like, see more. Does it help with aroma, like exposure, like what? Yes, so typically martini glasses, that shape is intended to allow um, some more oxygen into a cocktail. So it's not, I mean, a martini is just gin. And gin is gin. So you want to just, you want to. Um, on gin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You want to you want a little more um, surface area for gotcha. the cocktail to breathe. Gotcha. But I, I mean, I have a coupe glass. A martini glass is also called a cocktail glass. It's very nerdy, but you have I a glass at home, you, you can drink this. out of it. This is amazing. Oh, right. thank you. What's next? Some ice. So I snuck a I snuck a scoop from the kitchen. I'm gonna bring it back, y'all. I'm sorry. And, and it don't even fit. So that's what I get. So we're gonna dump some ice in here. And this is the really important part of a martini. You want to stir it until you think you've stirred it enough and you just need to stir it a little more because you're introducing dilution, you're introducing water into the cocktail, and so you really want to dilute it well. And that's what really makes a martini. When you see somebody just throwing them back, it's because it's very well made where it's, it, all, all cocktails are about balance. So I'm just going to stir this for, I would say, roughly 30 to 45 seconds if you mm -hmm. had to, like, you're practicing and counting. <laughs> Y'all like my nails, by the way? <laughs> we do. I was like, let me get my nails did for this, because, you know, your nails are cute, too. Everyone, I love looking at everyone's nails. Like, <laughs> My nails actually match Clancy's outfit. Yeah, we, oh, ooh, it does. We should swap, swap nails. Swap nails. It does. <laughs> so you said olive or lemon. What does that do for the cocktail? Olive complements the savory elements of a martini. I think lemon adds brightness and just some contrast. I understand those two things, yes. <laughs> so this is pretty solid. I mean, I could go for a little longer, but the, the glass is frosted. We're in a, we're in a good space. And I'm gonna pour it. I'm gonna pour it out first in here, and then we're gonna have our. We're gonna do our thing. Um, so I just got. That's a strainer. The strainer. This yeah. is. It's a variation of a, a strainer called a Hawthorne coil strainer, which has some relation to Boston. There used to be. There was another Hawthorne before the Hawthorne. I would say most folks know here in Boston. The Hawthorne, not middle. Isn't that like a community center? Hawthorne? Nope. No, the Hawthorne. A bar. <laughs> It's I a, two lives. <laughs> it was a bar not too far from here, actually. Um, RIP. Yeah. But even before that, I mean, we're talking like early 20th century, the Hawthorne. So I'm going to strain that out. And you'll notice, you'll know your martini is good when it's, it pours almost like syrup. That's exactly what I was thinking. Like, that uh, looks like a simple syrup right there. It has like really nice viscosity to it. Wow, and it's like it, the water introduces, like it enhances the texture. And again, this is why people are willing to just drink gin. Yeah. So. <laughs> So I'm going to peel a little bit of lemon here. Nice, healthy lemon twist. And I brought this peel from my house because this is the only one I trust. <laughs> so what are your tips for, for someone who's <laughs> starting for the first time, feeling a little bar, or, you know, home or elsewhere? Yeah. So level one, we're just going to, what we call is express the peel. So I'm just going to squeeze it right over the glass and run the oils of the lemon peel around the rim. And then level two, we're going to manicure this peel. So I'm just going to cut a, a cute little shape into it, uh, like so. You know, something that's a little more visually yeah. appealing than just dropping the twist. So you're getting glass. zest in their oil and a little bit of the rindy. Yeah, pieces. you'll get a little bitterness from the peel. Bitterness, too. okay, got you. Does that balance the sweetness? What does that do for you? I, I'd say so. I like. I don't. I don't flip the peel to run it around the glass, but uh, inevitably this peel drops in the glass. Talk to me like I'm two. Flip the peel. What's that? 
if I, instead of leaving it like this side, just. Except, I got you. Yeah. Right. And then I'll, I'm gonna cut the other side of the peel. I'm just cutting these like little strips. That's a book in it's and of a, itself. Just it like really is. cocktail Watch. garnishes. I need that book. Yeah. yeah. I think you maybe should write it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm glad you picked up what I was putting down, right? So oh give that a little gosh. twist. And it just becomes wow. like really interesting. And then I, I tuck am. it on the glass. Oh my, oh my gosh. Cheers, y'all. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that is impressive. Thank you, Mildred. Thank you, Mildred, you. and Thanks. thank you, Kai, for the inspired, Thanks. wonderful drink. I could watch I'm that do for it again I could for watch us, you do this for hours. hours. Yes. Just <laughs> ten more, please. Sounds well, if you want to do that, you just go to Comfort <laughs> Kitchen, <laughs> right? Yes, okay, you yes. can Love sit it. at the Coming bar. Back to Boston. This is this is on the menu at Comfort Kitchen, so yes. you know where to oh find us. This is blasphemy. Do Don't you? do this. Don't just pour another drink in ice. But it's a, it's a who, who said it was wondering? <laughs> yep. <laughs> And you were right. You were right to wonder. I'm just doing it for the sake of time. I okay. would. I always like to use fresh ice because this Why is. Why are you using fresh ice each time? Yeah, you want because you want to start from the top with that. Like this is already kind of restart the process. Okay. First. Yeah. Got you. But Can you say quickly where to find Comfort Kitchen? Just a shameless plug. Am I allowed to do that? We can do that. Yes. <laughs> Comfort Kitchen is on 611 Columbia Road in Dorchester in Upham's Corner. What's good? Like. <laughs> Talk about a beautiful restaurant in the heart of Dorchester. It's an honor. And shout out to my team. Super honored. Come visit. We're open Tuesday through Saturday for a dinner service. And then we're open Monday through Saturday for a cafe service in mornings and afternoons. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, Kai. I can't wait to dive. Not dive. I shouldn't dive into a drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amy, so... Again, thank you, Clancy L. Kai, for this conversation. Again, Clancy, for this amazing piece book that you wrote, um, for being inspired and for sharing your talent with the world, but also the talents of 66 other um, black women and femme in this food space. My pleasure. Thank you for thank you all for being part of this conversation, and thank you all for coming out tonight. It's really it makes uh, for a really fun for kind of. This is the first time I've been to Boston as an adult. So, <laughs> thanks for making for coming out. I'm gonna round it out with an adult beverage. Yes, very <laughs> <adult> beverage. <laughs> That's it for our panel for tonight. But thank you to each of you for showing up to this space. Um, I'm gonna invite Amy back up, and we have some cocktails, and maybe we have some birthdays. Ah, Ooh. Where are we going? This for you, Tanika. December fourth or sixth? Fifth. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. So, Tomorrow. Yeah. A little side story. Kai and I have worked on projects for the last few years, and they tend to be on the first Monday night in December. And for three years in a row, it's been on Kai's birthday. So, <laughs> advance apologies, but also happy birthday and Thank thanks you, for sharing your talent. Thank you. And last so, week was well, Elle's birthday. So, we're texting back and forth. And I'm like, Jamaica. So happy birthday to both of you, and thanks for sharing your talent. <laughs> thanks for sharing your talent with Boston. Amy, over to you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, <laughs> we have uh, BU Food and Wine Program, who is our partner, have prepared. They always do. They take a morsel from the cookbook. And tonight, from Clancy's book, Jarrell Guy's Smoked Okra Dip with uh, little um, toasts are in the lobby waiting for you to taste. And Clancy will be signing um, copies of her book. Frugal Bookstore is our um, partner tonight. This is such a wonderful book for the holidays. I really mean it. I mean, it's beyond it. There's you just there are recipes. There are stories. So buy the book for the holidays for a friend or family. Uh, coming up next here at City Space in a couple weeks is we have our annual tradition, the reading of the Christmas Carol with our favorite host, Tiziana Deering, Robin Young. Oh, by the way, Robin interviewed Clancy today for Here and Now. So if you listen here and now, keep your ears uh, attuned. She's going to be on the National Midday Show at some point um, in the next few days about her book. Um, anyway, 
uh, December 19th here in this room. Come listen to this wonderful annual tradition of the reading of a Christmas carol. We have a cappella carolers singing, and we serve hot chocolate and cookies for kids and adults um, for all things happening here at WBR City Space. You can sign up for our newsletter. Thanks. We'll see you in the lobby.